I'd like to call the public hearing to order. Um, and just a reminder, we do have, we're audio recording the meeting as we normally do. Um, it's not live streamed because we're up here at the high school. We do have a trial, which is our new device, which is what we've heard about, the Google Powell, which is a streaming video and audio service. It's not live, it's only recording to test at the moment. Um, and so that will be today, but the audio will be posted to the website after this meeting. Um, so, if you can please rise and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic which just stands one nation under God, indivisible, liberty, and justice for all. Please join me in a moment of silence. So again, this is the Hillsborough Daring School Board public hearing, um, April 15th, 5.45. It's been duly posted in the newspapers and the website um, and notified as in the proper manner. The purpose of this hearing is to discuss the following expenditures, up to 125,000 from the HVAC Expendable Trust and up to 330,000 from the Maintenance Expendable Trust for the high school boiler replacement project. Um, it's, it's actually three items. The second item is up to 120,000 from the Roof Expendable Trust and up to 80,000 from the Maintenance Expendable Trust Fund for the repair of the high school roof. And, and lastly, up to 30,000 from the Technology Expendable Trust for the replacement of the firewall system. Um, and so we do, we have a brief presentation on those before we open it to public comment. So I'd like to invite uh, Grant Geisler to come and speak to those items. Um, so there is uh, in your packet for, for board members, uh, the first page after the agenda, um, and some materials for this, but Grant also for folks who didn't want the whole packet, also has um, single copies if that is of use to anyone. Thank you. Okay, that. thank you. Um, we already talked about this briefly, but since this is the public hearing, I'm going to go over the materials again. So um, there are a few projects that need to be tackled this summer and need to be sourced from the district's trust funds. The first one is the high school boiler replacement, which you all know has been number one on our capital maintenance plan. Um, our current estimate is about $450,000 or so. Um, the bids are due May 1st, and uh, we're hoping to press on with board approval on May 6th, as far as that timeline goes. Um, the reason why the boiler replacement is needed, obviously, it's beyond its life expectancy. Um, they're 25-year-old uh, boilers, um, and if they fail, we could be looking at significant downtime because of the cast iron sections that um, are long, long lead items. Um, as the paper says, uh, we do have heat loss and efficiency issues. Um, we have lack of redundancy. Um, even though we have two boilers, the hot water is circulated by a single drive, so if that fails, we can't circulate. Um, and uh, we can replace existing heat pumps with two variable speed drives to provide that redundancy. Um, Domestic hot water is provided by a separate boiler that's in good condition. However, redundancy is currently maintained by an electric water heater, which is in poor condition and due for replacement. And we plan to incorporate a zone from the new boilers to serve as the redundancy and eliminate the electric water heater. That last one, that last item about domestic water, hot water, I have to admit was not on my radar. Um, but it was brought up by our consultant, EMC, um, and I'm grateful that they did. Uh, while I'm on that topic, um, just to explain a little bit why we ended up partnering with EMC, uh, I reached out to some colleagues of mine, business managers, and heard that Epping School District had recently gone through a boiler replacement. So I called the business manager there to see how their project went. Um, she had initially tried to do the RFP on her own. Uh, the bids came in high and she wasn't um, fully confident that she had captured everything that needed to be captured in the RFP. 
So they decided to use a consultant uh, for preparation of the RFP, engineering work and project management. She was thrilled with the work of the consultant. Uh, the project turned out great and the cost was much lower than her original bids. In fact, the company that bid on her original RFP bid on the updated RFP and came in $100,000, more than $100,000 lower than their original bid with her RFP. Uh, the consultant also obtained some energy initiatives, or not initiative, energy incentives, which helped defray the cost. Um, I asked about which consultant, and it was uh, EMC. Uh, it turns out, for those of you who don't know, and I'm going to bring this up because we're a small community, um, EMC is the company that hired my old facilities director out from under me, which was a little bit of a sore spot for me because we were left in a lurch and had to quickly try to find a replacement, and we had that position vacant for at least a couple of months. Um, I'm getting over that, especially since we now have Mark, who's doing a great job. Um, but in case it ever comes up, I just want you to know that I decided to partner with EMC despite the fact that our old facilities director works with them, not because he works with them. Um, I've also told uh, um, EMC that I don't want our old facilities director to play an active role in this project, just so there's no perception issues. Um, moving on to the second project, the high school gym roof. Um, it wasn't on our list, but as I told you last time, we've, uh, we've sprung some leaks. Uh, right now, Mark is kind of playing whack-a-mole with the leaks on the gym roof. Uh, it's over 33 years old, so it's beyond its useful life. Um, so instead of just continually trying to patch leaks, we want to go ahead and replace that gym roof, or yeah, the gym roof. Um, Bids were due on April 11th, and contract approval is actually on tonight's agenda later on for the regular board meeting. Uh, the third item was firewall servers. Um, the cost of this requirement is much less than projects we would capture on the capital maintenance plan. That's why it wasn't there. Um, our firewall servers are nearing the end of the useful life, so they're susceptible to failures and performance issues. Um, and they will no longer receive security updates and patches, which increases our security vulnerability. We would be replacing three servers and a log analyzer. The estimate we have for that, and Neil can correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, we're thinking maybe 27,500 for those three items, um, or four items, excuse me. Um, we probably will wait until after July 1 to order those items and then have everything set up before the next school year. Um, I've provided the estimated balance of the facilities and technology trust funds. Um, they are slightly higher than the amounts I showed you at the last board meeting, and that's because some interest needed to be factored in. So I got the updated numbers from Bill Shee. I think we're actually still missing a couple of months of accrued interest, but nothing significant. Um, if you noticed in the, in the discussion about today's meeting, we talked about, I think, up to, um, on the HVAC, I think we said up to 125. That's just because we're planning on being able to use all of that money. So I know that this says we only have 122,593, but by the time we start pulling money out of there, it might be a little bit more, but we wanted to make sure that we asked for up to an amount that's beyond up what to the current 120. balance from the, from the roof? No, for, uh, sorry, HVAC is 125. So HVAC, we said 125, and the balance right now is 122.6. From the roof, we said 120, the balance now is 116. I didn't want you to think that was an error. We have to say up to an amount that's higher than the current balance. And, then, and to clarify, the reason why we're taking it from each fund respectively is to take care of like the, the roof fund and then the maintenance after that, which is what our previous plan had been. Right, the, the plan was to have a maintenance trust fund that could cover any kind of requirements. And so instead of having a roof and a HVAC, and I think we even had our paving. Yeah. Um, so what we're doing is closing out basically the HVAC and the roof trusts, and then we'll tap into whatever we need from the building maintenance trust. Um, that will leave us with probably about 
$82,000 in the maintenance trust, but we will be adding $250,000 to it after this year closes out. Um, the tech trust has uh, probably about $100,000, will have about $100,000 after this. So um, I think that was about it. That's the quick wrap on that. If anybody has any questions, I can try to answer them. I just wanted to clarify, you somewhat just answered it, but the trust fund balances, that's before we, before the voted amounts are added at the end of this fiscal year, correct? Correct. Yep. So we would, there's about, there would be about 82,000 left in building maintenance after we do this. And then we'll be adding 250 because of the article that was approved last month. Thank you. Yeah, yourself, facilities, and the administrators have all been busy with uh, chasing things around, unfortunately. Trying to get a few things done before the beginning of next school year, yes. Any questions from the, well, I guess, uh, questions from the public, and then we have board discussion during the meeting. Um, mm -hmm. uh, is, is there anyone from the public that wishes to speak? Um, yeah, if, uh, yeah, so Rache, if you'd like to come forward, I don't see anyone else yet. Uh, please, please state your name and town for the record, even though, you know, we know who you are, but that way it's record picked up by the audio. Uh, <coughs> the company that was chosen and the fact that our former facilities maintenance guy is over there. And uh, one of the questions that I have is I'm curious if our purchasing policy was followed when choosing this particular company um, out of Maine. I'm just curious if there were other companies within New Hampshire that would have been equally as qualified to be able to handle the engineering for this. Um, and maybe there would have been a little bit of a conflict having our former facilities guy involved behind the scenes, even if he may not be on the forefront of the list. So that's one question I have. Um, some other questions I have. I looked through the drawings on this, and um, one of the things that jumped out at me, which was quite interesting, is that the details of this drawing and this RFP are revolved around the um, Hillsborough Daring Elementary School. So if you look at the drawings that they provided you, they're specifically stamped with the elementary school. When you look at the details, they actually list four schools, Goffstown High School, Bartlett Elementary, Maple Ave Elementary, and Hillsborough Daring Elementary. So. I'm quite curious as to um, the details on this. The other thing in the notes, they specify here that to see sheet M001 for general notes, there is no sheet M001 in these drawings or in the package that I received. The package starts on page M002. Um, so that... Is pretty much the extent of the questions that I had and what I was looking at here. I think the rest of the, hopefully, oh, the other question I have is, is this going to be a sealed bid? Um, given that this is going to another company and it's a company where a former employee of this school worked and has many relationships with others, I think that it would be in our best interest that this be a sealed bid so that um, prices and job scopes and stuff can't be shared with competitors. Oh, there was one more. Biggest part. I'm going to visit the greenhouse again. Oh. So we have a hundred. Is that that's that's actually the as um, part of this public question. comment in the meeting? Public it's, hearing part of the question for this job. Uh, it doesn't necessarily pertain to what we're withdrawing from the trust funds on. It has to do with the repairs and maintenance. So these are repairs and maintenance, and we're using one hundred and six thousand dollars of our repair and maintenance money to build a greenhouse structure. The greenhouse structure, which is a capital item that takes over, and, and if you look at your audit, your audit specifically says that costs over $5,000 will be in a capital item. You're using our repair and maintenance money from this year's budget to build a greenhouse. That repair and maintenance money can be used for these projects, and we don't have to take out as much from our trust funds. So that's how it ties into this. And when I read RSA 32.8, these funds fall outside the definition of 32.8. There was no money applied for capital improvements, which is what your greenhouse project is. And by allocating the repair and maintenance fund to build a capital structure, it falls outside of the necessity. There is no necessity for the greenhouse. There is a necessity 
for a boiler, for a roof, and for anything else that you guys are doing here under the repairs and maintenance. So you don't have to pull it out of the trust fund money, not all of it, $106,000 can come out of our budget that we have today. Yeah, and for correction, it's, it's not, well, we could discuss it during the meeting, but it's not, it's not coming out of the trust funds, it's coming out of the budget. Yeah. The trust fund money that you're taking, you're taking more of the trust funds than you need to because you have $106,000 that was transferred into repairs and maintenance. And it was transferred earmarked to build a greenhouse. Your greenhouse is not a repair and maintenance item. It's a structure, it's a capital asset. And if you read your, your audit report, your audit report specifically states that your capital assets are, it says here, let's see, capital assets with a cost of 5,000 or more is what it says on page 15 of your audit. The school district capitalizes assets of cost of $5,000 or more. The greenhouse is $106,000. The greenhouse itself is $67,000. The project is $106,000. That $106,000 can be put to the repairs and maintenance here, and we can keep some of that other money in the trust fund. So that's my comment is why aren't we keeping more in the trust fund and using it for a future repair that's needed? That was a savings account to handle repairs. Thank you for the clarification of your comment. Is there anyone else from the public that wishes to speak before we get into any responses? Um, we wish to. Um, it's a public hearing. Yeah. This is the okay. public's opportunity um, to comment and ask questions. Yeah. So we'll, yeah, we'll, when we get when we get into the, the meeting is when we'll have a discussion and responses. Is there anyone else from the from the public that uh, wishes to speak? Going once, twice, three times. Okay, so there's no one that wishes to move forward, so we will um, close the public hearing um, and call the school board meeting to order. Um, and we've, we've already done the Pledge of Allegiance and the moment of silence. Um, so just want to take a minute for the board to review the school board norms, which are on the next page of our packet after the, uh, the trust fund summary. Um, as the norms of assuming good intentions, being present and prepared and communicating effectively, placing ourselves in the mindset of how we'd like to um, conduct ourselves and conduct business for um, the purposes of this meeting tonight. So, any comment from board members on that? Let me get them along. And so we'll, we'll uh, move on to the uh, Feature presentation of this evening too. I'll let the superintendent um, introduce our, our first of a couple of speakers. So for, for those of you that have not uh, met, before, this is Matt Upton. He is an attorney with Drummond Winsome. He is the school district's attorney. So you have met Chris before and uh, Paul Plater and Mike Kenny, um, but our two newest board members are Stacy Warren and Krista Davidson. Um, and so Matt has a, a presentation. I do have um, a copy of what he is, of his slides, if you want that ahead of time so you can take notes on those. Um, I'm happy to pin those out. Thanks, Kristen. And then for you and Paul. Thank you. Thank well, you. Good, good evening, everybody. Can people hear me? I'm not used to a microphone, but the, the recording won't pick it up unless you use it. Okay. It, it helps it, it helps the audio pick up. Mm -hmm. Does it? Okay. Yeah. Otherwise, it doesn't pick up that well. So again, my name is Matt Upton. I've been a school lawyer now for over 30 years. I've um, been doing this particular presentation probably for the last 25 years. It's changed quite a bit. Um, and one of the real reasons why I, am, I actually enjoy doing this presentation is because um, there's very little information, particularly for new board members, when you get on the board as to really what your job is. And you can go to the New Hampshire School Boards Association and they'll give you a lot of information about what the RSAs say, but they don't always give you information about why things are structured the way they are. So it's not part of the presentation, but just a little bit of history about school districts, I think, is really helpful. So really what you have to do is go back to the mid-1700s or uh, mid to late 1700s 
to where the history of school districts in New Hampshire began. And there was a very, very healthy conversation with the legislature and local, um, at the time, select boards about establishing schools. The legislature really wanted to have the population of the state of New Hampshire educated. And at the time, most children in the state were relegated to working on family farms, working on family businesses. Um, a lot of the history talks about in the seacoast, students would um, help their parents run the lobster boats and fishing boats that ran off the coast. You go up to Maine and still even to this day, they take a month off in the fall to harvest potatoes in some of the northern areas of Maine. So this was part of the, the fabric of our state in the 1700s, mid 1700s to later 1700s. And the legislature really wanted students to get an education. And in fact, this, this I want to call it a local struggle, but there was locally the, the parents were pushing back and wanting their kids to be working with the family homesteads. Select boards didn't like taxing people to fund these schools. And there was a very um, <clears throat> constant, I want to, not disagreement, but there was a healthy level of skepticism between the legislature and local politics and local government that they were actually going to fulfill the need to educate students. And in fact, when you get closer to the 1800, we started seeing actual um, legislation being passed where um, select board members were individually fined for not properly funding the local schoolhouses. Now, back in this days, we did have school boards, but their role of school board was to find a teacher and to find a home that would actually house the teacher. The teacher lived in various homes throughout the community, basically for room and board, and what they had for educational materials was typically one book per schoolhouse um, and one set of writing materials that was shared by the entire community. That evolved over time to where our curriculum started to become available. And what we saw the legislature do in response to this was to enact legislation creating what they called superintending committees. These were committees that were like the school board that actually dealt with curriculum and making sure the students were actually getting an education. As we went through the 1800s, this kind of pushed by the legislature, pushed back against local politics, continued until the um, early 1900s when we saw the first superintendents being hired. And the legislature was so concerned that students were, weren't going to get the proper education if local politics got involved, that the superintendents originally were employed entirely by the state of New Hampshire. And they were there to really make sure that the local communities were giving an education to the students. That continued up until 1970, when finally it became what we see now, the local school districts actually hire their own superintendent. But in the process throughout the 1900s, we started seeing a number of laws coming into place that really tried to limit the impact of local politics on the education that students were receiving. So school boards were relegated to policy making while superintendents were given the authority to the day-to-day -day operations of the schools. And knowing that this healthy um, concern between the legislature and local politics exists helps to explain why some of the rules exist now is it, you know, like, well, why is the school board relegated to just doing policy? Well, for many years, they were concerned the local school boards weren't going to provide the money or the education to schools. And so that's why we had these superintendent committees and eventually superintendents that were really put in place to ensure the day to day operations of the school district. It's out of that, that evolution that you see a lot of the rules that exist now. 
Um, so the scope of the presentation, I talked to you a little bit about general school board roles and responsibilities. Talk to you a little bit about right to know law. I'm going to talk to you about your role in personnel matters, and then I'm going to talk to you just a little bit about school board liability. So, as I said, primarily school boards' jobs are to um, make policies, and those policies are what actually govern the operation of the schools. Um, you're to you're looking at strategic goals, policies that help move the organization towards the community's shared vision or at schools. So your role is really to take input from the community about how the schools are to be operated in terms of policy, and then handing those policies to the superintendent who will actually execute those policies on your behalf. A lot kind of like the legislature. The legislature passes laws and the executive body executes those laws. You're the policy-making function of the school district the superintendent and administration executes the policies that, that you pass. Um, your role in the operation of the actual school district is limited. Your, um, your role in, is to really adopt an operating budget, to establish committees, um, to work with other officials and agencies on policy making. You do have a role in electing teachers. We call that, a, the term is electing. It's really hiring teachers, hiring certified staff. You actually have a role in that uh, process. Um, and you also have a direct role in evaluating and hiring the superintendent. Um, you establish school calendars, which is part of that policy making function. But the day-to-day -day operations, again, instruction, curriculum, how the buses run, the grounds, the equipment, students, and personnel, non-certified personnel, are really the purview of the superintendent. Now, many, many districts, I'm not sure if Hillsborough is one of them, they have the school board elect all employees, but technically your role by statute in one of the to elect and certified staff. So in your in your packet, every every meeting, there's the appointments, leaves, and resignations. But the reason that they come in two parts is what is the ones that need board approval, and then the others are you'll see at the top of that memo it says for information only. So that's the the, the non, non certified the non certified staff, staff in that document. Um, but there are still many districts throughout the state that actually. The school boards elect all employees, certified and not certified. But technically, under the law, it's um, that's the school the school board's authority only it pertains to certified staff. But there's another role that you also play, which is a diff little different than your legislative or policy making function. It's the function which we call the quasi judicial function. You often have to sit on appeals and sit on hearings. Um, for instance, if there's a contested non-renewal, we have a tenured teacher who contests the fact that they're being renewed. You would sit on a hearing or an appeal where you would have a voice in that. You would also sit on um, appeals or grievances, appeals from the superintendent on grievances that are covered by your collective bargaining agreements. These are areas where you're acting in what we call a quasi-judicial capacity. In other words, you have to be impartial and act like a juror. You can't have prejudgment. Um, and I think the Peel of Hopkinton case says you have to be impartial and free of actual bias or prejudgment whenever you're acting on those matters. Those will typically be brought forward as a hearing and you'll know they're a hearing. Normally, if you're having a hearing of that type, I will sit with the school board and assist you in that function. But it's um, in that case, you're acting like a judge. There are also things that arise from day to day that really relate to conflicts of interest. I find that a lot of boards walk in, or a lot of new board members walk into the office and they don't understand what conflicts of interest are. Um, and there's a statute that deals with conflicts of interest, and it's RSA 21 
G 21 through 27, and it addresses um, this issue. Um, and what the statute does is prohibits participation by a public official in a matter in your official capacity where one of your, either your spouse or your dependent holds a private interest in a matter which could um, directly or indirectly affect or influence your decision. So in other words, if your spouse was involved and put in a bid to do some work for the school district, that would be a conflict of interest for you to be voting on that contract. Same would hold true if, you're, if you had a daughter or a son who was a teacher, you wouldn't um, vote on that teaching contract because that would be a conflict of interest. If the battery's going dead too, we can always switch it out. That might be what it is. Is it still working? It's still working. But it's yeah, I think it's just the connection. If it um, continues to, we can switch it out. We've got a mic on the side of the table. So this is typically, and you can keep these slides and go back and refer to them, but this is when you have a conflict of interest. If you have um, a direct financial interest in an outcome of a board decision, if you have a family member who has a direct um, <clears throat> affected by the outcome of your decision. Um, if you, are, uh, you have an employment relationship, like say your employer was trying to contract with the school district to provide services, that would be another situation where you would recuse yourself. <clears throat> also, if you're in a butter to a property, um, you're a butter to property that's subject to a decision, like if you had property that was a, a budding high school or the middle school, there was some decision relating to um, that property, you would have to recuse yourself. <clears throat> you do have an ethical obligation to acknowledge if you have a conflict of interest and you shouldn't be bashful about asking a question. Um, ultimately, it's your decision if you feel like you have a conflict of interest, it's not for anybody else. You can request um, the board to weigh in on whether they believe you have a conflict of interest, um, but ultimately it's your, um, it's your decision. I will caution you though, if you do have a conflict of interest and you do participate, it could invalidate the decision of the board. <clears throat> but there's also a, a function that you serve, which is a legislative function. And what I mean by that is, I like to use the example of um, a gym floor. Say you've got a, you're looking at the budget and you're considering the expenditure of $100,000 to replace the gym floor. And your daughter plays on the basketball team. And before you get on the school board, you've come before the board many times saying how the floor is not right, it's got dead spots, it's not level, because your daughter has complained about it. Now, when that comes up, you might say to yourself, well, gee, my daughter is playing on the team, and I've got an interest in the outcome of this vote. The reality is your interest in the outcome of that vote is no different than the interest of any other parent or any other student in the district. So you're acting at that point in a legislative capacity that's not your sole direct pecuniary gain, or you're not, you're personally gonna receive anything that somebody else isn't receiving. So in that situation, it's not inappropriate for you to vote. Um, but that's different than when you're acting in a quasi-judicial capacity. Because when you're acting in a quasi-judicial capacity, you have to act like a juror. I know it's confusing, um, but if you think about it, think about the legislature. The legislature votes all the time for spending bills to pave roads. And a lot of those roads are roads that the legislators drive on every day. And they don't really have a conflict of interest, even though they're gonna benefit from paving those roads. So as long as the benefit is, your benefit is no different than anybody else in the district, you don't have a conflict of interest. There's um, also a case that 
we just actually referenced an earlier slide from Hopkinton, and that deals with bias. Now, from time to time, you may be required to send on a personnel matter in which you may have formed opinions about a particular staff member. And as long as those opinions and biases do not um, allow, do not prevent you from acting um, as a juror, you're allowed to sit on the hearing. But it's more like just I'm aware of situations. Um, it's the Mary Beth um, Stevens case is the case that is involved out of Hopkinton in which a principal um, was terminated and when she was terminated, the board sat on it, but was aware of some of the employment history. All the members of the board felt that they could sit on the case impartially, even though they were aware of it and may have even had some minimal bias. But again, it's whether you have an actual bias, whether you um, are disqualified from, from, um, from participating. Prejudgment is another thing that can disqualify you from acting in a, only in a quasi-judicial capacity, not a legislative capacity. And in fact, you know, when you're acting in a legislative capacity, say there's a committee about that replacement of that gym floor because your daughter was um, involved in the basketball team, you may actually have some, some input on what should be done with the floor. You could very well serve on that committee, whereas if you were to sit on some other committee, <coughs> prejudge the facts, that could be a problem, particularly if you're sitting in a quasi-judicial capacity. Outside knowledge, this is another one of those issues where you may have personal experience. You and your job may um, have some information about what is good computer equipment, what is good copying equipment, and you're free to share your opinion about that. The fact that you have an opinion it does not preclude you from sharing it with the board. The one thing that I want to caution you about is if you do have this uh, independent knowledge is not to launch into your own investigations about things. One of the things I see in a lot of boards where they become dysfunctional is when board members decide they're going to conduct their own investigations and they come in loaded with all kinds of information that the rest of the board doesn't have. You're always better if all that information can be gathered and be shared, even if it's coming from you, shared with everybody before the meeting so that people are prepared when they come in and they don't feel blindsided by all that information. But it's fine to share opinions. Um, I would just avoid launching into investigation, particularly if those investigations relate to claims of any type of employee misconduct. Matt? Yes. Uh, this is one area that uh, I'm kind of concerned about. Mm -hmm. I taught computer technology for over 20 years. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to uh, IT and stuff like that, I don't have a vested interest other than my education and my background. Okay, I don't plan on doing any investigations, but I plan on asking questions. Okay. And, and that's perfectly fine. And if you, I think this maybe did die now. Yes. It's just another Any better? Yep. So, um, no, it, that's perfectly acceptable for you to have opinions you want to share. Like if you've had, um, in your experience, had a very poor track record with a particular product, like a particular Chromebook, you might want to share that. You know, we've had nothing but trouble with it at the uh, tech centers, and we don't buy them anymore. That's a perfectly um, permissible thing to do. And, and I think it's appropriate. And sometimes you're going to be picked to be on committees because of that knowledge. And if there's a subcommittee of the board looking into it with, with your technology integrator, you may very well want to share those at the lower level before they come to you. Um, I think it's much more functional when you can share it with the administration rather than the administration coming in having made a decision and now you were kind of correcting the administration and say, I wouldn't buy that piece of equipment. Um, 
that just leads the administration feeling distrusted. Um, I would clearly try to steer you towards speaking with the administration ahead of time. Um, another thing where you may run into issues is relates to gifts. Um, and anytime anybody's offering you a gift, if they're offering you a gift because of your role as a school board member, you should take a, a moment to pause and reflect. What is the expectation behind the gift? Are they expecting me to act in a particular way? Are they expecting me not to take action in a particular way? But if there's anything, any expectation tied with that gift, you should reject it. It's pretty simple. Um, but if it's just a, a, an honorarium, that happens quite often when somebody's retiring or leaving the board, they might give them a members of the public may come forward and give you something and gratitude for your work. Um, obviously, when you're leaving the board, it obviously not being offered for the sole purpose of influencing your decisions. But um, you should really be careful when you're accepting gifts from people and what the expectations are associated with them. Um, this slide really deals with things that I think um, have been the source of problems I've seen on boards over the years. Um, one of them comes up fairly regularly, and that is you end up at a meeting in, in town and say it's uh, one of the local um, churches is having a meeting and they start talking about something to do with the school. And you stand up as a member of the school board and start talking about something that's happening or the board is considering. It's important that you make sure that you, if you're speaking on your own behalf, that's one thing. But if you're speaking on behalf of the school board, you need to be authorized to do that. And often people will try to co-opt you into speaking on behalf of the board. And I think what you need to qualify is say, I'm not. I'm not um, authorized to speak on behalf of the board. If you'd like me to bring that issue back to the board, I'd be glad to bring it back to the board and I'll get you an official response. But you're really only one vote on this board. The voice of this board is a majority vote of this board, not the opinions of one member. So try to avoid, and, it, it, and these things happen innocently. You know, they go, oh, you're on the school board. Gee, can, can, can you? look into this or what do you think and before too long they're attributing your comments to the school board and then members of the school board who may disagree will be offended so just make clear when you go to those meetings or if you're speaking publicly or a newspaper calls you that if you say anything um, you clarify your role um, Another thing that happens often is school board members will be in a school building and they'll confront a worker who they want to do something. Um, you should not be attempting to supervise or direct an employee of the school district to do anything. What you need to do is seek out the, seek out the building principal immediately. If you see something that needs to be done, let the building principal direct um, and supervise the employees. Um, you're going to come into contact with a lot of non-public information that is non-public for a reason. Normal, probably 80% of that is going to be personnel related or will be student related. Um, you are not to release non-public information until the minutes of the meeting have been made public or you've been authorized to disclose it. Um, it's something you need to be really careful about. It's one of the only reasons that a school board member can be removed is for the improper disclosure of non-public information. Um, from time to time, you're going to um, run into somebody in the supermarket who's going to have a complaint about a principal or a complaint about a teacher. It's important that those complaints be um, delivered to the superintendent and you need to advise who's ever going to give you a complaint that you have to you have to relay that information to the superintendent. 
Often what you hear is only the tip of the iceberg, um, but there might be other information that's being fed into the superintendent that will, um, that piece of information you've received at the supermarket could help us in directing an investigation where it needs to go, particularly if it involves misconduct involving students. It really needs to be reported. Um, if you have given information about employee misconduct relating to employee versus employee, sexual harassment being something that often gets um, reported, once again, you need to report it to the superintendent. Um, if there's a complaint relative to the superintendent, though, this is the one exception. That needs to be conveyed to the school board chair and the school board chair in turn will contact me and we'll make sure that that's appropriately investigated. Because obviously you're not going to go to the superintendent with the complaints about the superintendent's misconduct. Any questions so far? Any, any questions from the board? I'm good. May I ask one question on that based on our structure with the, what he just said about the complaints on the superintendent? Actually, you know what? I was going to ask the same question. So sure. it might be helpful for clarification, and especially because we do have new board members. I was thinking the same thing. How do you know we, what we, we have the, uh, the it, Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, with the SAU structure, our SAU is three boards. Right. Those were Deering, Washington, and Windsor. And this, our SAU is technically the board that actually hires and correct. evaluates. Our superintendent, superintendent. Hillsborough Deering, just has a you know it's part in the voice in that. Right. So would it be appropriate for someone to come to the uh, obviously the, chair of the these, SAU board would be the one that would be involved. But um, if you felt more comfortable coming to the local board chair, who would in turn go to the SAU board chair? That's also appropriate. Okay. I mean, you have as a local board, you do have an interest in the misconduct or alleged misconduct of the superintendent, but technically it's the SAU board that supervises and oversees the superintendent. Cool. Thank you for the clarification. Thank you, Thank you for the question, too. Um, the right to know law now is um, a large source of litigation among school districts. and. Well, most of the focus is on what are non-public sessions and what are public records and what records do we have to produce. Um, there is a small part of the law that's often overlooked, which I think is actually the most important part of the right to know law. And that is the preamble. And the preamble says, the openness and the conduct of public business is essential to a, demo a democratic society. That one sentence alone tells you a lot about what the purpose of the right to know law is. And the right to know law is to try to the greatest extent possible to provide public access to the actions, discussions, and records of all public bodies and for them to be accountable to the people. This, this particular provision of the law is probably the one that people almost ignore, but it's actually the tool by which you use to interpret the right to know law. I'm a very big advocate of doing as much as possible in public session where the public can see what is happening. I, I'm not the one to be asking questions about how we can do this in non-public. I'm the one who's gonna be asking you, how can we do this in public? Because I think it builds trust with people um, that is vital to the operation of the district. <laughs> Public meetings get, um, can happen in a lot of different ways. I mean, this is the traditional public meeting where we get a quorum of the school board together in a public meeting spot that's um, noticed. And obviously we all know it's a it's public meeting, but public meetings can also happen when you don't realize them. One of them, one of the classic examples is when you start engaging in an email conversation with other board members in a way that you are sharing opinions contemporaneously, that can actually create a meeting. 
a meeting that's not been posted, and a meeting for which often minutes have not been kept. So you need to be, you need to understand that a meeting occurs whenever there is a quorum of the board that's available in which they can communicate with each other contemporaneously for the purpose of acting upon matters or matters over which the public body has supervision, control, jurisdiction, or advisory power. So what this doesn't mean is if you're at the local sandwich shop and the quorum happens to show up and you're all ordering at the, at the lunch counter, that's not a meeting. Mm -hmm. You know, you're there not acting upon something over which you have supervision and control. You're trying to get lunch. That's different. Same thing happens if you have, um, you're at church and you happen to notice as you're walking out, you see two of the other board members there and you start having conversations about the church and the church service. That's not a illegal school board meeting. That's what we call a chance social or other encounter not convened for the purpose of discussing or acting upon such matters. And such matters meaning those over which the board has jurisdiction. But you should be mindful when you are using email particularly because that seems to be the, the situation I deal with most often <clears throat> where the board starts responding. I like to say that email is really best used for scheduling and scheduling alone. Mm -hmm. And that substantive discussion should never be had during an email exchange. <clears throat> um, I don't know, is, there, is there a bottle of water? <laughs> As an objective, <laughs> getting gifts. <laughs> Normally, uh, a quorum of the board is a simple majority, and I believe your rules have it as a simple majority. But technically, if you wanted to, you could um, have a larger number than a simple majority to create a quorum, but your rules don't do it. Another area where I'm seeing a lot of um, litigation is um, with regard to subcommittees of the board. Anytime you set, set up a subcommittee of this board to handle any issue, it's subject to the same provisions of the right to know law. So if you had a capital improvement subcommittee that would be subject to the same rules <clears throat> and those rules relate to having a quorum taking minutes having um having um it being noticed at your meeting um and all the requirements regarding non-public and public minutes um, if you're going you know, if the subbody is going to go into a non-public session all the same rules apply this is one where i'm seeing a lot of um, committees that just don't realize they're under those same rules um, <clears throat> i've seen a lot of it lately with regard to committees that are working on the budget so if you have a subcommittee that works on the budget every year they need to understand that they're subject to the same rules as the school board. <clears throat> Requirements for all your meetings that they must be accessible to the public. <clears throat> um, there must be a quorum of the public body physically present unless there's an emergency. I'm not going to get too much into emergencies. Uh, minutes must be taken. Now, minutes do not need to be a verbatim transcript. And in fact, when you're dealing with non-public minutes, I'm going to tell you they should be very brief. Um, and the reason, one of the reasons why your non-public minutes need to be so brief is recently the legislature has required you to keep track of sealed public minutes. And for many, many years, school districts just sealed uh, minutes involving personnel matters. Losing my voice. 
and um, now they're required to go back and review those minutes and to determine if the reason they were sealed in the first place exists. So there's one simple way to handle this, and that is your minutes. All they need to say is discuss personnel matter. So all your minutes have to say, you don't have to identify who you were, those minutes uh, relate to. Then you can release the non-public minutes. The public knows that you dealt with a personnel matter. <clears throat> and there's no need to seal the minutes or go back and review them. Um, to the degree you are having communications or if anybody wants to appear electronically, all the communication between members needs to be discernible to those in attendance. That means also you can't be texting each other in a meeting um, because that those communications are not discernible to those in attendance. And now you must have a, comment, a public comment period of at least 30 minutes. You can have emergency meetings where people can appear electronically um, or without without 24 hours notice. Um, those um, those meetings, uh, the chair must conclude that it's immediate, undelayed action is imperative. Notice of the time, place, and um, of the emergency meeting must be posted as soon as practicable, and you need to use whatever. Um, means are reasonably available to advise the public of the emergency meeting. And the minutes of the meeting must clearly state why the emergency exists. Um, I'm not a big fan of members uh, participating electronically. We did it all during the pandemic when we had people that were um, quarantine for, near, for a number of reasons. Um, it's, it's really not the best means of participating, but if you do, um, you must be able to communicate contemporaneously with the other members of the school board. Did this one go down? I'm not sure. Oh, okay. That's the back. Um, which means you have to use something like the OWL or something so that you can hear what everybody's saying, including the people who are remote. Um, you also have to, if you're appearing remotely, you have to identify anybody else who is present with you, including your children, if they happen to be in the room. And you have to have the minutes must state why you are um, appearing um, electronically. Um, except in an emergency, which we kind of covered a minute ago, a quorum must be physically present wherever the meeting has been noticed. <clears throat> Non-public meetings, again, are another one where we see a lot of litigation, a lot of issues. And those uh, non-public minutes are, are meetings are limited to these reasons. The dismissal, promotion, disciplining, or compensation of any employee unless that employee has a right to a public meeting and request no. There are some, um, particularly police officers, who have a right to have those meetings publicly. Oh, thank you. You are the best. <laughs> I'm losing my voice very quickly. <clears throat> the hiring of any public employee can also be discussed in a non-public session. And this is the catch-all, this is the one that's most often used, is that if you discuss the matter publicly, it would affect the reputation <coughs> of any person other than a member of the body itself. Um, when you're dealing with issues related to board member misconduct, they cannot be dealt with in non-public session. There are some other areas where you can go into non-public session. And these are kind of, I think, self-evident. You know, if we're talking about selling a piece of district land or property, <clears throat> and we're going to talk about what we'd be willing to accept for that property. Obviously, if we disclose that in a public meeting, people would know not to bid anything more than what the minimum amount we're willing to accept. 
Um, if you're negotiating regarding litigation, again, it may be a situation where you might be willing to spend more uh, to settle a case than you need to. So obviously that kind of thing you would not um, discuss in public session. Emergency functions, you clearly don't want to talk about all your emergency buttons and their location and how they work or how they could be disabled or steps you've taken to prevent them from being disabled or the location of security cameras. That type of stuff would not, um, you wouldn't want to be in the public domain. There's also, um, in non-public, you can also consider legal advice that's provided orally in writing. Um, if I'm here, if I'm local, and we're having a discussion, we can do it as what's called a non-meeting. We'll talk in a minute about what a non-meeting is. But if I'm not present, <clears throat> and you're just going to be looking at a legal opinion I've given, you can do that in um, non-public session. And the last one that was added recently is uh, student tuition agreements. Often we negotiate with um, neighboring districts to tuition students in, and um, what we're willing to accept for tuition can be negotiated back and forth. Some of these tuition agreements are very detailed. Um, some of them I've negotiated recently have um, a lot of sending districts are looking for school choice. So a lot of those district, a lot of those agreements have different provisions that um, allow for higher tuition based on the percentage of students that are being sent to us as a receiving district. Obviously, those conversations, if we had them in public, would um, undermine your position in those negotiations. Um, very important thing here, if you're ever going to have a non-public session, it has to be open in public session first. The motion to be made uh, needs to reference a specific non-public purpose and cite the relevant statutory provision. Uh, there has to be a roll call vote taken and noted in the minutes. Um, a majority vote of the members present is required. Uh, minutes must be taken. And once again, I'm going to tell you those minutes should be very brief so you don't have to seal them, but will notify the board will notify the public why the board went into non-public session. Again, going back to that whole theme of being transparent with the public, you build trust when they know that you're meeting, oh, they're dealing with a personal matter, I get it. Um, you don't need to discuss every detail of the personnel matter in those minutes. And you have to make sure that the discussion is limited to the specific reasons. And this is more of a responsibility for the board chair to um, make sure that the uh, discussions don't wander away from the purpose of the non-public session. So non-meetings are different than non-public meetings. Non-meetings are meetings that in essence really aren't a meeting, a public meeting of any sort. Um, and they're very limited in what you can have a non-meeting for. Um, your collective bargaining. Do we have a contract coming up this year? We do. Yeah. yeah. So opening negotiations within a month. Yeah. So um, this is one of those things when you're meeting to talk about your strategy, where you want to be with raises, um, pay increases, those kind of things. Um, you should have some idea before you enter into negotiations what your plan is. Um, obviously, if the union knows what your plan is, you're at a significant disadvantage. So you can do that in a non-meeting where no minutes are required. That's the difference between non-public and non-meetings is A, you don't have to have a public meeting to open a non-meeting. You don't have to have a motion roll call to go into a non-meeting. You do not have to have minutes from a non-meeting. You don't have to come out in public session to um, to seal minutes from a non-meeting because there are no minutes from non-meetings. And these are the reasons by which you can. Um, consultation with legal counsel when I come up, we're talking about a legal issue, we can do that in a non-meeting. 
Um, and really, this, this other chance social media, other encounters of a quorum, it's really not a non-meeting. It's just not a meeting, if that makes any sense. Um, you're also allowed to circulate drafts of documents without it creating any uh, formal meeting or non-meeting. Again, here are the reasons, the differences. No minutes are required for non-meetings. No postings are required for non-meetings. Um, there's no public meeting required. Um, no roll call is required to go into. And no requirement for um, a quorum to be physically present. Matt, yes. let's just go back to the, the circulating documents, just for clarity's sake, the, that it's circulating documents to formalize a decision that's already been discussed and made in a public that's session. Correct. Not, that's correct. Not the first draft, the last draft. That's correct. Okay. Just to... You can technically you can you can circulate drafts in the early stages without creating a meeting. The concern is that if you start giving input to those documents and then send it back in a reply all function. Now you're sharing thoughts contemporaneously. And if you create an email chain of those, now all of a sudden we've, we've walked ourselves backwards into a meeting. Again, it's the ability to contemporaneously share ideas that creates the meeting. So it, you need to be mindful, particularly with email. I just, I just have some very strong feelings about email. email amongst the board members should only be used for scheduling. You shouldn't be commenting about any type of substance in an email. I will be there, I will not be there. I can make it, I cannot make it. Um, because I see so many errors occur where board members are commenting on substance and before too long, we've created a chain of emails going back and forth where everybody's now chiming in and we've created an illegal meeting. And the, what really is embarrassing about that whole process is not that it happened because it can happen innocently enough. It's that people start talking in a way because they feel like they're doing this behind the scenes. They may share things that they really wouldn't want to share publicly. So it's, it's really something to be very careful about. And you should not also use your own home email addresses. You should all have district email addresses and you should use them. And the reason why I'm telling you that is I've had numerous cases in the last 20 years where we've received subpoenas for the um, email accounts of individual board members because they have started using their individual accounts to correspond with the board. And so you want to avoid that unless you want some judge looking through your individual email account or lawyer. I, for most of us, I don't think that's a line you really want to cross. Um, but again, differences between non-meetings and non-public meetings are really set forth on this slide. Um, these are the, the minimum requirements for public minutes. Names of members, uh, present time, meeting start and ended, persons appearing before, a, a brief description of subject matter discussed, any final decisions. Um, again, I say this because I, in particularly in non-public minutes, I don't want them to be a verbatim transcript. Everybody's different about how much information they want in their public minutes. I'm not gonna tell you one way or the other what's best for you. But I can tell you with regard to your non-public minutes, unless you want to go through the practice of reviewing sealed non-public minutes all the time, you're better off to make them brief. Sealing of public minutes, I find more minutes that were sealed improperly um, because there's only three limited reasons by which you can seal minutes. And that is this um, disclosure would adversely affect the reputation of a person other than a member of the school board. Um, disclosure would render the proposed action ineffective. This is that exception we talked about earlier, we're dealing with uh, contracts or if you're gonna sell a piece of land or 
your negotiation strategy, those kind of things were would be grounds if you were in a non-public. And then and then the safety exception, which is a general requirement, which actually allows you to seal minutes for that reason as well. Um, Again, I, I believe very strongly that minutes should be drafted in a way where you don't need to um, seal them. Um, this is more of a practice point. Before you go out a non-public session, I would ask, um, I would have the school board chair ask who's ever taking minutes to say, what do the minutes say? so that you know before you come out of non-public session what your minutes are going to say. That way you can make the determination about whether you really need to seal them. And then, then you can also talk about whether it fits into one of those three requirements. But it used to be that sealing was kind of, if we were dealing with a personnel matter, it was just became perfunctory. Uh, I'm going to seal it. And second, and we would go on sealing them, um, now that we're required to review these minutes uh, on a periodic basis, I really think that you should be, have, excuse me, having that conversation before you leave the non-public session. Um, governmental records is now becoming a bigger issue um, in litigation because of all the electronic records that we maintain. Um, used to be, we all knew what a governmental record was. It, it was a white piece of paper with print all over it. And if we had it in our possession, it was a governmental record. Nowadays, um, where we store things on the cloud, we have things in servers, what constitute a governmental record is a little more different uh, topic. But you need to understand it does apply, whether it's paper, electronic, or other physical form. But it, it doesn't mean every document that's in a school district is a governmental record. Some of those records, if they've not been received by a quorum of the public body or received on their behalf in furtherance of official function, they may not be a governmental record. When you get, in, when you get a right to know law request, I get the call, I go through it um, with the superintendent. So this is probably something you don't have to worry that much about, but you should be aware that governmental records do include electronic records. There are some records that are um, exempt from disclosure. Again, I go through this with the superintendent every time we receive um, our right to know law request. And these are just for your um, information or the general categories of what are not, are not considered uh, governmental records subject to disclosure. Um, if you keep um, personal notes during your meetings, they may be, um, they may not be governmental records. However, if you're being asked to keep those notes or somebody is expecting you to keep notes, then they will become governmental records. There are a lot of governmental records that um, get deleted, um, yet with today's technology, we can recover a lot of documents. So there is this um, act, well, lack of a better term, which is called legally deleting um, records. And that is typically what I call uh, document shredders. So a lot of school districts retain documents for a particular period of time, and then they, if they're not saved, they're shredded. That would be a form of, of legal deletion. Um, but there are also some records that have to be kept. Um, there are certain um, statutes regarding student records that have to be retained. There are certain employment records that have to be retained. But now what has happened is we've now gotten into, when it deals with personnel records, we've gotten into a balancing test that relates to disclosure. And that's again, something I deal with the superintendent. 
but that balancing test involves balancing the um, impact of disclosure on the party resisting disclosure um, versus the public's interest in disclosure of the information. So we no longer have a person a um, exclusion for personnel records. This is more about what constitutes the invasion of privacy, and that was that uh, balancing test, balancing the public's interest in disclosure against the interests of those favoring non-disclosure. And this normally happens in cases involving employee misconduct. You won't normally see this, uh, but I will deal with the superintendent about it. Um, there are a lot of information you gather um, uh, that employees have provided you with. And generally that information for the most part is, is um, private, um, so long as it doesn't reveal anything about the school district's conduct um, is generally not within the bounds of the right to know law. This is a slide a little bit out of sequence, but I'll get back to that. Um, when are you required to make these records um, available? Normally, you're required to immediately make them available. If there's going to be any delay, we have to um, notify the requester within five business days if there's going to be a delay and why that delay exists. Um, again, email is, again, one of the these are things that we deal with the most in litigation. Um, I would use it primarily for scheduling purpose. Um, I've already talked to you about the fact that it can, um, it can create a meeting. It can also create a governmental record. Um, if we're not keeping those records on systems or servers of the district, it can be a problem because they're not available for um, inspection. Um, another thing that I'm very concerned about is when we start using text messages and email as a substitution for deliberations. And while it's technically not a violation of the law, I think, you know, if you have strong feelings about a particular policy that's coming up, I would share those concerns um, publicly rather than texting other members of the board to say, you know, gee, I, I'm really opposed to this spending money on this advanced placement class, or I really don't think we should be spending all this money on rebuilding the playgrounds. Um, I would really, if you have strong feelings, you should share them here. Even if it's not a technical violation of the right to know law, if it undermines the spirit of the right to know law, in other words, denies the public the ability to know how you think and feel as their elected representative, I think it's improper. Um, and you should have those conversations publicly. I've already talked to you about the fact that if you use your own personnel, personal email account, it can be subject to a subpoena. First and foremost, remedies of the right to know law are generally disclosure. So if, for instance, if there was something that was improperly sealed, minutes that were improperly sealed, the remedy would be to disclose the minutes. Um, if somebody does sue the district on a right to no law request, they can get injunctive relief going forward. Um, we, can be, uh, we can be required to pay attorney's fees and cost if we're acting in bad faith. Um, and um, I think more so now, they're awarding uh, fees if they believe that the lawsuit was necessary to bring compliance. In other words, you resisted, resisted, um, and they brought the case and then you disclosed their awarding uh, fees and costs. They also go through this, uh, this um, analysis about whether you knew or should have known about the violation of the right to no law. That used to be more 
board friendly that inquiry. Now, I think because of the proliferation of right to no law cases, courts are more likely to find that the board knew or should have known of the violation. So you need to be very careful um, because the, the likelihood of paying fees and costs is greater now than ever. Um, every once in a while, we'll know that there's a case coming. And if we know a case is coming, I'll issue what's called a litigation hold letter, which will tell you to retain records. If you actually destroy information for the sole purpose of preventing its disclosure, you can be guilty of a misdemeanor. So if you get a litigation hold letter and I tell you to keep all your emails, you need to keep them. Um, um, there is also um, now a provision of the right to know law that if, if we have somebody who's harassing the district with repeated requests um, for information who brings um, a lawsuit that's unjust, frivolous, or uh, vexatious, um, there is a provision now that allows the school district to recover attorney's fees and costs. I haven't seen one yet. So personnel matters is another area. How much time do we have? Are we running out of time? We are not. And we have until you are finished and the board has had a chance to ask you their questions. Um, this is another area where I think there's a lot of um, misunderstandings about what the board's role is. Um, I can't tell you the number of times I've personally been sitting in a supermarket and heard a conversation between parents about a principal or a teacher that they think is ineffective. And I can only assume from time to time somebody's going to approach you in a supermarket and talk to you about um, an employee that they think is um, not doing the best job. And often that will happen after you get elected. They'll approach you and say, God, I'm, gee, I'm so glad you got elected. You know, I've been waiting for somebody to get on the board who's going to do something about this principle because this principle has just been wreaking havoc on all the children of the district and then we'll launch into this long tirade. And I think you need, or I think it's a really good idea to stop the person before they get very far into their conversation and, and really suggest that you turn that conversation to the superintendent. Because by listening to it, you're creating this expectation you're going to do something about it. And the reality is you have very little control over personnel matters. And really, your only control is to give it to the superintendent and then maybe follow up with the superintendent to say, hey, did you follow up on, on Jen's concern? Um, because I want to make sure that you know she, her concerns are heard. Or you might go back to Jen and say, hey, did, um, did Sue call you? I saw her at the supermarket. I told her to call you. She mentioned there was a concern about the principal. You might have that kind of conversation. But once you launch into listening to the concerns that the constituent has, you're creating this expectation you're going to do something about it. And 90% of the time, there's nothing you can do because your role is limited to what's on this slide. You know, you can you can adopt policies to effectuate recruitment, employ, employment, evaluation of teachers. You can work on evaluation instruments, um, but you can't do the actual evaluation. You can hire annually and evaluate the superintendent of schools to the degree you're part of the SAU board. That would be pro appropriate. You get to elect certified staff. So the superintendent comes in every year with a slate of teachers that are being nominated, you get to elect that, those teachers. Um, you get to adopt policies relating to discrimination and sexual harassment. And on occasion, you may be asked to dismiss a teacher, but that's going to be coming at the recommendation of the superintendent. Um, you can also hear grievances related to employee discipline under the collective bargaining agreements. And you can hear appeals um, of tenured teachers in the non-renewal process. 
But this is it. This is it. You're not going to be going in and fixing the problem that the person's had with the principal. Um, that and by and again by listening to it, I worry that you're creating the expectation that somehow you're going to do something about it. I think you're much better off to stop the person and say, you know something, I really don't have jurisdiction over the principal and, and this issue. You really need to go to Jen. And what can I do to help you do that? Because a lot of times employee, these people in the public don't want to go directly to, this, to Jen or may not want to go to the principal or may not want to go to whoever is the direct um, supervisor of the employee because they're worried that their child is going to be discriminated against. See it all the time. I, I just didn't want to come forward because I knew that principle would make my child's life hell, so I just didn't want to do it. But we really are good at monitoring that type of behavior and making sure there's not retaliation. But we need to know this stuff. And if there are problems with our teachers, problems with our employees, we need to be able to investigate it. And if, and the person who's just sitting at home saying, I don't want to do it because I don't want my child to be retaliated against, is denying us the opportunity to fix the problem in the first instance. And you really need to encourage these people to come forward. Otherwise, again, we're going to miss the opportunity. I can't tell you the number of cases when the initial report came in appeared to be relatively innocuous. But once we got a, that little piece of information, we were able to discover some pretty significant misconduct that we would never have found out about but for that small little piece of, of uh, information. So it's really important that, that I think when you hear somebody's wanting to talk to you about misconduct, you say, Hey, I can't do anything about that, but the superintendent can, and I'll make sure the superintendent follows up with you. Can I help you get this complaint to the superintendent? And then follow up with the superintendent to make sure that the person actually went to the superintendent. Because we, um, one of the things I worry about, things that keep me up at night, are the person who comes to you and says, I think there's something going on between teacher X and the student. And I can't put my finger on it, but they're, they're not, it doesn't appear normal to me. And you get that report. And then you say, listen, you need to go talk to the superintendent about this so we can investigate it. And that person walks away and says, I'm not going to do that. I just, I just don't want to get involved in this. And my, maybe, my, maybe it's in June and the end of school year and, their child is graduating, so they don't want to deal with it. But it's denying us the opportunity to dig in. And sometimes that's all we get is that one opportunity. So it's really important that you follow up with the superintendent and make sure that that report is being made. When it comes to discipline, you really um, are confined to three areas. And that is after discipline has been imposed, and this would be discipline that does not involve uh, termination. Um, you might hear an appeal from a grievance. Now that would be somebody is saying that there's not just cause for the discipline that's being imposed. It comes up in the form of a grievance. Um, the union representatives there, I'm usually there, and it involves interpretation of the agreement, whether there is most often just cause for the discipline. That's one area where you wouldn't be involved in discipline, but you're really more reviewing the discipline than imposing the discipline. Um, dismissals of teachers. Um, if the superintendent believes that they have to dismiss the teacher, the, the superintendent will make a recommendation to the board and there will be a hearing before the board for dismissal of a teacher. Um, the statute is, is a little dated it uses these um, terms, immorality, failure to maintain competency standards, or in the bigger one, bigger category is conduct that does not conform to the rules prescribed 
those rules prescribe being the policies of the district. Yes. I'm a union steward, so I yeah. generate business <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, you know, we deal with a lot of these. Um, we haven't had a lot here. We have a fairly good relationship with the union here, or the unions here. And we usually resolve most of these things at the lower levels. I can't even work. I thought well, maybe we had one grievance two years ago. It's been a while since we've had a grievance. You know, we, we don't normally have them. We usually work them out at the lower levels, which is consistent. I typically, at the board level grievances, I probably have only a handful of, of them per year, and I do probably 15 or 20 different school districts around the state. So they're not that common. Um, in today they used to be far more common you know 10 or 15 years ago but we've most of the advocates we now have like the union stewards are realized that it's in our best interest to, to try to work them out so we do but occasionally you have to um and the only other time you might be involved in discipline would be if you're on the sau board you would uh, maybe deal with the supervision of the superintendent or any discipline involving the superintendent. Right now, non-renewals are a big issue because tonight is the deadline for non-renewals, April 15th. Um, and non-renewals need to be treated separately than terminations. Non-renewals are not a termination of a current agreement. They are a decision not to hire somebody in a future year. While they both result in loss of employment, they're fundamentally different. Um, your board's, the board's role in the non-renewal process is limited significantly um, by state law. Um, so how does the non-renewal and renewal process work? Um, for non-tenured teachers, these are teachers that have worked in district less than five years if they are brand new teachers or less than three years if they attend te tenure, attain tenure in another district. Um, for, for these non-tenured teachers, the superintendent makes a nomination and the board elects. However, if the non-tenured teacher is not nominated by the superintendent, that's the end of the conversation. You have no play no role in the non-renewal of non-tenured teachers. The superintendent's decision is final. If they do not, if she does not nominate, there's nobody for you to elect. For tenured teachers, there's um, you do play a role. For tenured teachers, um, if the superintendent nominates, um, but the board doesn't want to elect, the board can actually make the decision not to elect, or the superintendent can say, I'm not going to nominate this tenured teacher, in which case there is an appeal from that decision not to non-renew the tenured teacher, and that appeal comes to the school board first. And so you would hear the reasons for why the superintendent didn't nominate the tenured teacher, or you may also <laughs> talk about the reasons why that teacher was not elected. Normally what happens is if the board has got concerns about an employee such that they don't want to elect, it, elect that person, that conversation is had with the superintendent and the superintendent decides not to nominate the employee. That's the way it normally happens. And then the appeal comes to the school board, in which case you're sitting in that quasi-judicial capacity you need to be impartial and you need to hear the, the reasons why that non-tenured teacher was not um, rehired, why that tenured teacher was not rehired, excuse me. Um, once again, the rules relative to being quasi-judicial apply, can't have actual bias, conflicts of interest. You should not have any conversations with the teacher if you're involved in a non-renewal teacher hear, uh, hearing should not prejudge the case as much as you can possibly avoid it. If you feel like you can't act impartially, then you need to recuse yourself. 
I've had situations where we've actually gone to Superior Court and had an entire board appointed to sit on the appeal of a non-renewal because everybody, nobody felt like they could act impartially. Particularly if it involves one of your students, like say we're non-renewing a, a particular teacher and your student was adversely impacted by whatever conduct is giving rise to non-renewal, that would be a classic example where you shouldn't sit on the non-renewal and you should recuse yourself. Recusal is something that I think um, is misunderstood. I see a lot of people recuse themselves for no reason, which is not proper. But I also see people who should really recuse themselves demand to sit on matters. And um, recusal should not be used as a matter of avoiding your responsibility, but it should be used in areas where you can't be impartial. A lot of people I see use recusal as a way or abstentions as a way of avoiding taking a difficult, making a difficult decision or an unpopular decision, which I think is not really the reason for doing a proper abstention or recusal, but people do it. But I think it's more of whether you can act impartially is when you recuse yourself. Or if for one of those other reasons we discussed earlier, where you have a statutory conflict of interest. In a non-renewal hearing, the burden is on the superintendent to show that there's justification for the non-renewal. Um, but in the end, um, the statute states, and this really deals more with the appeal from your decision, that the um, grounds for the nomination or non-reelection shall be determined by the sole discretion of the school board. When it deals with non-tenured teachers, again, excuse me, tenured teachers, again, with non-tenured teachers, you never see it. Um, I had a case a few years ago involving a teacher that got, was non-tenured, and the superintendent made the decision not to nominate that teacher. The teacher contacted all the members of the board and brought a whole crowd of people into the meeting to contest the non-renewal. And I had to explain to the board that there was nothing the board could do because there was no nomination pending before the board. The board had no role in it. And even though the teacher was very popular, the teacher was not very effective in that case. And unfortunately, um, that's just the nature of the business. There are people who are very popular and not effective teachers. Um, when you're dealing with confidential information, if it deals with employee information, I would just take the position that no matter what, it's confidential. I would not release any information you hear in non public session about any employee. And you need to be careful about releasing student information. Um, and it's not enough to start talking about a student without using their name. Um, if you start talking about a student in a way that is um, easily um, traceable to a specific student, that can be a violation of FERPA. So if we have one blind student in the school district and we start talking about the school the student and without using their name, but refer to the student as being blind, that's usually very easily traceable to that particular student. And that would be a verbal violation. School board member liability. Um, occasionally you can be named um, in a lawsuit. Um, Typically, you will, um, you will have coverage for your legal defense. Um, but normally, and it's very rare, the board members ever have a multiple. And the only time I've really seen it is if the board member steps beyond the scope of their authority. So if they start acting, um, doing something other than what is a uh, uh, a duty of the school board uh, member, liability can attach. I'm trying to think of a good example, but most of the examples deal with destruction of information 
where I've seen school board members held liable. They destroy records and documents that are in their own um, possession that they've been told not to. But typically, you can be shielded from liability if you're acting within the scope of your authority and the actions you've taken are within are in good faith. But again, you have insurance coverage that will that will protect you. So what are the best practices? Avoid acting outside the scope of your authority. Um, don't knowingly violate anybody's constitutional rights. Um, that includes employees and students. Be careful about the release of um, employee or student confidential information. Um, there is no private right of action to sue on FERPA violations, but it can impact um, the district's federal funding. Um, don't knowingly violate the right to know law. Um, I mean, these I think are pretty straightforward. Um, not that you're going to be found liable, but if you if you do not recuse yourself when you've got a conflict of interest, it can result in invali invalidating the actions of the board. Um, make sure that if you hear of any criminal conduct, report it immediately to the authorities. Um, superintendent is a good starting spot. Um, also, instances of um, child abuse need to be reported. Um, and any, uh, we now have what's known as a DOE code of ethics. Not sure you would necessarily need to know what those, those requirements are, but if you feel like a teacher is acting unethically, you need to bring it to the attention of the superintendent so that we can look into it. And that's it, unless you've got some questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for that presentation, too. Very informative, lots of information. Um, and I'm sorry I'm losing my voice here. And yeah, hopefully, hopefully you'll be able to recover with uh, the refreshment um, and hydrate. Uh, do we? I guess we could kind of go around and round robin fashion too for board members. Um, you know, we could start on the other side too if with questions. Krista, do you have any questions that came to mind? Oh, I'm not really at this point. Yeah, it's okay if you, yeah. Um, it, it's a lot of information to take in. Yes. What I tell people is keep these slides. These slides are a really good kind of thumbnail for when you've got questions about what your obligations are. Um, particularly dealing with things like recusal and stuff like that. And this is, this is almost the Cliff Notes version of the, there's a book, Being a Better Board Member. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what it is. Um, if, if you want to know how to permanently destroy data, not the Hillary Clinton. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, destroying data has become kind of a big issue in, in school districts um, because now, storage is less costly it used to be storage was expensive and so what we did is we had these spooling programs that would destroy information automatically um now we're we can access storage pretty cheaply yeah in the cloud so it used to all have to be in rooms and that because of much of the records there's laws in place to now allow that you can you can keep records in the cloud as long as they're readily accessible by the district. You can keep governmental records in the cloud, but they have to be readily accessible. They can't. You can't have to go to a, another location to access them. So for years, what we used to do is we used to copy documents and put them on microfiche back in the day, <laughs> and then we would take the records and we would put them in, in some storage facility. But we'd also put the microfiche there. And so if you wanted to go see any documents, you had to go back to this location, pull out the microfiche, and then you'd go, and then they tell you it's in box 304, and you'd go to box 304, and there it would be. Nowadays, that's not a permiss that would not be an appropriate way to store government records. Um, most of those records now are so old that they've been most of them have been permanently destroyed. Mm -hmm. 
but now we're seeing more and more records needing to be kept. But there's also, at some point, you ask yourself, is there a need to keep records? Do I need to keep all these emails from 10 years ago? So a lot of districts have developed policies relating to saving emails. So if they're student records, obviously they have to be retained. And you have to go through a fairly comprehensive training of your staff to make sure that they're, they're permanently storing the records they need to store. But all this information of, um, you know, about the weather, about did you see the accident on the way to work? Does, does all that stuff really need to be retained? Because what we see is we get these right to no law requests and I literally will have to sit down and go through 2,000 pages of emails to determine which emails are protected because they might have student information in them and what emails have to be produced. And if we're saving every single email, at some point, we're just, we're just setting ourselves up for a lot of expense. So I'm starting to talk more and more with districts about trying to find a better way to get rid of the extraneous stuff. And the people who are making the right no law request, they don't want to go through this either. They don't want to go through 900 pages to get to the two pages they want. You know, it's not in their interest either. So we're trying to find a way to, to deal with that now that storage has become so inexpensive that we're keeping absolutely everything. Stacy, did you have any further questions or? Um, I, I had a question about um, like stuff that is seen on Facebook, like in Facebook groups and or people messaging you on Facebook. Like if a concern came up regarding a student or a family and they didn't sort of say reach out to me personally, but they posted it so that everyone can see it. And it is a concern that a lot of people are commenting on. Like, what is the right thing to do? So anytime you, if somebody obviously messages you, that's more direct. You need to contact the superintendent. Okay. But if you see something um, in Facebook, and I hate to say this, even though we know some of it is absolutely nonsense, we have to take every complaint seriously. And if you see something alleging that a teacher is at an inappropriate relationship with a student, you need to notify the superintendent, even if it turns out being nothing. Okay. Facebook is um, it's a <laughs> it's a very bad um, it's a great it's a great platform for getting out information, okay. notifying parents about. Um, parent teacher nights, um, um, any type of organized fundraising, it's great for that. Mm -hmm. But it's a really bad place for people because people become very casual and they start sharing information very casually. I really tell my board members that I would put nothing on Facebook that has anything to do with the district. I wouldn't respond to it. I wouldn't post anything, <laughs> I wouldn't say anything. I wouldn't even talk about what it's like to be a board member because it, sure enough, somebody's going to pick up on it. Um, I was in Montana about three weeks ago and I ran into a friend there who started talking to me about something with my sister-in-law that he saw on Facebook that had nothing to do with him or anybody in Montana. And it was like really disconcerting that this kind of information gets spread from from friend to friend to friend in kind of a chain right um so i just wouldn't post anything but we have to take all complaints of employee misconduct particularly relating to students seriously it's really important um i have no social media accounts whatever in fact i think i'm using carrier pigeons <laughs> Smart move. Yeah, that's a wise decision. Anything? Did you have anything else, Stacy? Before no. and Mike, do you have any other questions other than? If you hear, also sometimes what you would see on Facebook is some of our staff actually can get on Facebook 
you know, they get home from a long day at school and they get about the second class of Chardonnay and they start talking about their dad, what happened with this challenging student. And I think that they think that it's, you know, limited to a conversation they might be having with a specific friend. But the way Facebook populates information and shares it, it can find its way throughout. And I talk to us, the unions about this all the time, that, you know, an optimist com com comment about a particular student without using their name, but in a way that is identifiable. Next thing you know, we've got a whole chain of communications on Facebook that can be really, um, can, can be a real problem. I'll, I'll tell you why I don't have Facebook. Five years ago, I was, I went through this routine. I was accused for sexual harassment by a former student. She saw, quote unquote, my name on Facebook. Okay, whoever was there was trying to, trying to approach her. The guy's name was Mike Kennedy. I'm not a Kennedy, I'm a Kenny. Okay, and I had to go through Title IX. I had to go through a board of review. I had to go through the whole damn process. And you know who found the problem? My wife found the problem because she had a Facebook account. <laughs> So I don't have any social media accounts and I don't really like Facebook at all. Yeah, I, again, like email, I'm dealing with district business. Facebook is fun for scheduling stuff, for giving notice of events, to encourage support of, a, of students that are maybe competing regionally or nationally. I mean, all that stuff, it's great. It's you just have to be very, very careful when you're a school board member how you use it um, and be very deliberate about it. But anything you talk with your friends about, you might think it's being um, it's contained. But again, the way Facebook populates posts, you could end up going in directions you never intended. So I really discourage using it for anything. And I, I know that's one of the reasons why in past in past years, the, the school district, the SAU has done a nice job with creating the SAU presence on Facebook and other social media. So that way it's not through individual staff members or individual board members, but it's through a, you know, you can direct people to that spot. If that's how they want to access information. And if they want more, then they can go to the website or they can contact someone by phone. Um, or contact the SAU, you know, remembering that chain of command. It, it really does. And I can't tell you how many times I've run into cases where people have said things on Facebook that get misconstrued. And, um, or like we talked earlier about, one of those things was you shouldn't really speak on behalf of the school board unless you've been authorized. Where there's people who are school board members who go onto Facebook and respond to some post as if they're speaking on behalf of the school board, and then it gets some legs, and before too long it gets back to the other school board members, and they're all offended when you thought you were just sharing your own opinion. Right. It's, it just happens so easily. And a lot, of, a lot of bullying also occurs on Facebook, which is something that if you're, if you're noticing it or seeing it, it needs to be reported. Um, God forbid, you know, there's, there's been, not as much lately, but five to ten years ago, there was a lot of um, self-harm occurring from bullying that was coming off of Facebook because the problem being, once again, the way Facebook populates posts, it gets shared with a lot of people unintended that were unintended to receive it by the recipient. Mm -hmm. Paul, do you have any questions? Uh, yeah, just one. When talking to school board members of other districts, is there a line to be drawn? I mean, you know, well, I notice you built this project and we're trying to build it, but the bids are too high. Who did you get? How did you maneuver for that? Or information from other school board districts? There's, there's no real harm other than and again, this is a more best practices type of thing. When you all come together to make decisions, you want to be working on the same book of business, the same information. So, Paul, if you were to contact somebody over in where and they said, 
yeah, we had a real problem with that roofing contractor. You want to stay away. And you come in and you go, hey, I talked to people over in Ware, and they said, don't use that contractor. That's going to catch everybody a little bit off guard. So you're much better off to maybe do is pick up the phone, call the superintendent and say, hey, I was talking to the Ware superintendent. They said they had a problem with our that contractor that we got a bid from. Would you please follow up with that superintendent and find out more about it? And then, then the superintendent can can dig in deeper because sometimes what you're getting from the other board members may not necessarily be reliable. It could be anecdotal. It could be maybe the superintendent didn't even really share all the reasons why they had a problem with the contractor. But the superintendent can take the time to dig in that, dig in deeper and get the information we need. I mean, most of the time if we're reaching out in that capacity, we're hopefully reaching out with the authorization from the board or if we're on a committee, the committee, the subcommittee authorizes someone to get information from a particular source. I guess if it's if it's being given to us, then we have the you know the the the, um, the responsibility to bring that to the superintendent. Yeah, I, I think any of the information that's got to come in, like if you know something, you know, it happens a lot with contractors. I don't know why, or or vendors. We're going to buy like a a vehicle from some dealership that maybe you had a bad experience with or something in your family had a bad experience with. Um, you know, I would share it with the superintendent, share it with the finance office and let them do the legwork and make a decision about whether it's, it's relevant to our situation. But allow it to come up through the administration and it's not to silence your voice, not at all. It's just to make sure that everybody's getting the same information all at the same time. Uh, thank you. Is, is any, anyone else before we um, wrap up the presentation? Again, thank you for all of the information too. And we've been yeah, sorry, my voice is um, no, no scratchy tonight. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank yeah. you. All right. Thank you. So before before you head off, um, the second thing that oh, the yeah. board had asked um for your opinion on was the two petition warrant articles that were passed um matt i have a copy of the email that you sent earlier sure. today would that be helpful for you, to have? you copy with you. um so i was asked to look at the two warrant articles that were um approved at the district meeting one involving the termination of the three-year agreement with the landscaper and the other relating to using taxpayer money to, for lobbying. So this is kind of a, a complex discussion of what the voters role is at the meeting. Um, the voters approve appropriations. Um, they pass the budget, but their authority really relates to the appropriations that take place in a meeting. Now, with regard to the landscaper agreement, there are lots of agreements that this board enters into all the time, whether it's landscaping, whether it's copier leases, you enter into all kinds of agreements on behalf of the school board. And the legislature has given you the authority to enter into those agreements and said, you school board, this is your authority. You enter into these agreements. The landscaper agreement almost our article almost implies that there was a breach um, and i think the breach was really implied to be on behalf of the school district because it didn't ask for certain reports and records well you as a board have the right to waive any requirements on behalf of the contractor and that doesn't amount to a breach but terminating an agreement with a contractor is a breach of the agreement and um and it's not something that you should be doing um, lightly i think you if you terminate this agreement with the landscaper you will be subject to probably litigation related to the damages that landscaper will incur because it's not anything the landscaper has breached 
it's that we haven't asked for certain information from the landscaper, as I understand it. But, the, but beyond that, if every time we enter into a contract, that contract's gonna get invalidated by a warrant article, how, how does the district do business? It's, it's, it's really not feasible to have that that arrangement, and that's why I believe the legislat legislature gave exclusive authority under RSA 189.1 and, um, and ED 303.01 to the school board to manage these affairs, to um, enact policies, and to make sure that the district is operating. And if it chooses to discharge those obligations by entering into contracts with <clears throat> a particular landscaper, then it's that's within your authority. I just don't believe the meeting has the authority as it was set forth in the foreign to tell you you have to terminate an agreement with the landscaper. So I think I also have very strong feelings about voters say. And I think the board should listen to voters. And I think there's an expression from the voters here that for whatever reason, they felt that the contract um, should be looked into at a minimum. There are concerns at a minimum. I'm not sure because he uses the words, You know, failure to obtain competitive bids, um, lack of transparency and accountability. I'm not sure that those things are understood, but obviously if I saw an article like this, I would question whether that's an appropriate contract, but I'm not sure that those are factual. I know that there are opinions and there may be strong opinions and there may be have reasons for those opinions, but I'm not sure that um, but that's an appropriate thing for the for the voters to be ruling on. Yes. In, instead of terminating the contract, could we amend it? You could certainly, you could certainly, as a board, decide that you'd like to have a discussion with the administration about the contract in light of the fact that the voters approved it. But I don't think that the passage of the article requires you to invalidate the contract. I think that's something that I want to be respectful because I believe that the voters say and their words are important and their votes are important. And I think that this board should um, listen to the voice of the people. The problem is I just don't think it's binding. I believe it's advisory, but it's still something that the board should look at. Um, with regard to the second article uh, relating to using taxpayer money for lobbyists, once again, this is very similar to the other situation. Um, do your membership dues to the, number one, you don't hire specifically any lobbyists. What you do is you pay membership dues to the New Hampshire School Boards Association. I'm not aware of any other money that is paid directly to lobbyists. And in this case, the money is really not paid directly for lobbying. In other words, your, your membership in the New Hampshire School Boards Association isn't bifurcated that $3,000 is policy and legal assistance and thousands for lobbying. The New Hampshire School Boards Association does some lobbying. They do it on behalf of all their members. How that's funded, I'm not sure. I'm not technically sure how they fund it. Um, I assume that they would um, break it down across all members, but I don't know that. I don't know internally how they fund their lobbying. But the membership in that organization is more than just paying for lobbying. You, They provide you with policies. They provide you with policy reviews. 
They provide you with legal advice. A lot of the baseline legal advice that doesn't require my attention, you get for free from the New Hampshire School Boards Association. The policies that they give you are fairly good. I mean, sometimes I make some changes to them, but most of them are pretty good, which is saving you thousands of dollars on my legal services. And I'm willing to bet that you probably save far more than you spend in dues by having membership there. But once again, this is a decision the board makes about how it wants to, to discharge its policymaking functions, who it wants to contract for legal services or not receive legal advice from the school boards association. And I just don't think it's the role of the meeting to tell you how to discharge those responsibilities. Um, but once again, the meeting has spoken and the meeting has clearly indicated their concerns about spending money for lobbying. And so that's something that the board should listen to. Um, and I think maybe have a conversation about, you know, looking at your membership and what, what it is that you're doing with the New Hampshire School Boards Association and maybe engaging the public in a conversation about your continued membership. But once again, I don't think because this article passed that the school board has to stop its membership. It may ultimately decide it doesn't want to continue to be a member, but that's a decision I think for the school board. And I just want to say, I, I really support the sentiment behind these articles because this is what democracy is all about. Uh, when, people, when people in the public are not happy with things that they see on their district, this is one of their ways. And I, I defend their ability to bring these things forward. I just don't think that it's within the purview of the meeting to make those decisions. I think those are issues that the legislature has given to the school board to make those decisions. So I, I believe both these articles are what we would say are advisory, but I would certainly encourage the board to consider those, the voice of the meeting. Thank you. I know. So I know, Stacy, you had that question. I don't know if you have any follow. -up. Um, does anybody else have any questions on on his, uh, his his review, his brief on those articles? Like Paul. I think we're all set. Unless there's anything else. Um, so thank you again for. Yeah, sorry, I'm sorry. I'm a little under the weather here, but um, I I hope that I I've given you something in an email that. Um, the superintendent kind of lays out some of the thoughts. Yeah, thank you again, too. Thank you for taking that time to go over there with us. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And then, and then uh, second. You, you have a, a second presentation tonight. So, Rache Colcom, chair of the trustee of the trust funds of Hillsborough. And in your packet, they have the. Um, it's after this, after the uh, the non judicial settlement agreement um, that the trustees were bringing bringing forward is in your your packet uh, right after your norms. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, and and thank you, Mr. Upton, for that because I on those Warren articles. I did know that they were non-binding and advisory warrant articles, and they did get put through without intention. So I appreciate that. Okay, um, the trustees of the trust funds. Last year, uh, when we were working on our trust funds, we made a decision that we thought would be beneficial um, to the several different parties that do receive our trust funds. We have several trust funds that were under $3,000 or right around $3,000. They aren't making a lot of money in earnings. So what we what we researched was that we were able to submit a non-judicial settlement agreement with the Charitable Trust Division of New Hampshire. 
And in doing so, we were able to combine, at least have the option to combine some um, trust funds together. Yeah. So for Hills World, um, Darren, you've got several scholarships. Several of them were small. They were under $3,000. They were not earning a lot of money. Um, so when we were issuing scholarships out there for $100 or maybe $150. So we submitted this to combine a bunch of scholarships that have the same purpose. They're pretty general. They didn't have any specific requirements as far as the education beyond that. So we submitted this so that we could combine all of these different scholarships together and make it one scholarship distribution to the students. In order for this to go through, um, it re the, the uh, Charitable Trust Division Director requested that we get a signature from the school board chair so that you guys were notified of what it was that we were doing and to you know get your support on this as well. So that's the purpose of this and what our intention is as far as cleaning up our scholarships. So I'm here tonight to look for your support. Uh, I think it, re it requires a vote, so I'm looking for a vote and a signature on this so that we can combine these. I appreciate you taking the, the time to put the effort into it to help you know, generate more funds for our students and scholarships. Um, and so it does, it does look like that that's what that's trying to do. So I appreciate that and thank you for the work that you've done. It's technically the same amount of funds. It's just done in one scholarship instead of five distributions to maybe the same student or to different students. That's all. Simplification, simplification maybe is another terminology. Does actually before you does anyone have any questions oh, for the uh, trustees before? I'm like, assuming it's up to the board to decide what the division is going to be on that consolidation. No, it's actually not. It's up to the trustees of the trust funds. So it could be one. One allotment, ten allotments. Oh, I'm sorry. For the distribution of the scholarship That's to the right. student in the end, it's the school's choice as to how this. I think the guidance office is who decides Actually, yeah. um, how the scholarships will be awarded. They they currently are the, the group that helps oversee it. Um, but this again, thank you so much for the effort that the trustees put into this. This is going to be very very helpful for everybody involved. Um, so the the. School administration is, is recommending that the okay. board vote to authorize the chair to sign the document. We really wanted to have this done last year, so sorry, didn't get done last year. Yeah, and, um, Mike, did, does that help with the, Does that help with your question? Stacy, Krista, did you have any? Yeah. Okay. And Paul. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you for bringing us this. Um, so no, actually, we are at the point of this, um, just before 8 o'clock. Um, any correspondence? Uh, we do not have any correspondence. I do have some recognitions. Do you want me to launch straight into those? Yeah, we can do that. I mean, um, do, do we want to take a quick pulse check? Is everyone doing okay? Because it is a longer maybe, meeting. Uh, maybe maybe a break after public comment? If we need to, if, if okay. that's, or we can move if through. People to need that. So, so I do have uh, a, a handful of uh, student recognitions uh, from the elementary school. They would like to recognize all of the students in Mrs. Carson's first grade class. Alexa, Lane, Nathan, Charlotte, Griffin, Jackson, Raymond, Cora, Kaylee, Leslie, Jacob, Christian, Haley, Phelan, and Finley. Um, so in January, uh, they the entire class needed to change their teacher and their classroom, um, and they the decision was made that they do this as a group. Um, they were able to make this adjustment without any issues. They are always supportive and positive with each other, and they're very proud of how well they're doing. That that is a incredibly difficult transition for a group of six year olds to make, um, and. Uh, I'm going to commend Ms. Carson about that in a little bit. But um, And then the middle school uh, has a group of students who were chosen to participate in the New Hampshire Music Educators Association Southwest Music Festival that is coming up next month. And so for band, that is Noah Welch, David Kopp, Alex Gringo, Caden Baker, and uh, in chorus, we had Sydney Christensen, Liam Stewart, and Caroline Molina. Um, and then also from the middle school, uh, back in February, but we hadn't had record, we didn't do recognitions in, in March. Um, but the, uh, the following students were involved in helping set up, clean up, and serve during the end 68 Hours of Hunger fundraiser that happened. And that's Dominic Robinson, Ben Davison, Connor Dumas, and Owen Bober, and just 
commending them for, for those activities. Um, and then staff recognitions, again, they've built up because we didn't do them for the, the last couple of meetings, but I'll, I will try to go uh, quickly with giving people their, their flowers here. So Terry Carson volunteered to change grade levels and take on a new class of students in January. Terry embraced the change and made the students feel loved and cared for. With Terry as their teacher, these students are thriving in many ways. Um, Joanne Johnson, she teaches in sixth grade at the middle school. Mrs. Johnson recently put together an awesome unit for the sixth grade students, and this unit students wrote resumes to apply for a job as part of an archaeological dig. The students then interviewed for their positions, were assigned a role, worked with a dig team to design their company and get sponsorship, and then completed an actual dig in their classroom. The kids thoroughly enjoyed this unit, and not only did they learn about ancient Egypt, they also learned about some important life skills that will be helpful to them in the future. Eliza Tasker is a special educator at the middle school. I'm always amazed with Mrs. Tasker's work. Through her patience and kindness, she reaches students that others cannot. She provides a safe space for her students to learn life skills, and she works hard every day to ensure that they can be successful in the real world in their own way. I truly admire her work, and I often wonder how our school got so lucky to have her. While I endorse all of these sentiments, I do want to point out to the to the newer school board members, there is a mechanism that staff can nominate their colleagues um, for recognition of the school board. And so these are not my words, I'm just presenting them. Dan Forrester, who is a special educator at the high school, Dan volunteered to take on the leadership role department head for the special education department at the high school and has done a great job. He communicates, he regularly communicates with the staff, sends reminder fields questions, provides support, and is approachable. Thank you, Dan. Christine Haley is the music educator at the elementary school. She put together a phenomenal concert for chorus, emceed, and charmed the whole audience. She does. Brittany Milligan, who is the music educator at the high school. Brittany did an amazing job facilitating the district choral concert. It was the first time that we've had a K-12 choral concert, um, and all three of the music teachers did a phenomenal job with that. John Young, who's a social studies teacher at the middle school, he has been attending many out of school events and taking beautiful, beautiful photos of our students in action. It's a lot of work and one parents, teachers and students, students will appreciate for years to come. Sarah Peterson, who is the library and media specialist at the middle school. Sarah may be new to the building, but you would not be able to tell that from the kind, friendly atmosphere she has cultivated in the middle school media center. Students are clamoring to visit and it's clearly become a refuge for many. Paul McQuilkin, who is one of our uh, math, Title I math tutors, um, Paul is a dedicated educator. Uh, he shows a strong commitment to his students each day. Paul loves to find a way to make learning fun. Sue Kingsbury also um, is works in the Title I program at the elementary school. Sue is a breath of fresh air. She has so much energy and enthusiasm for wanting to see her students excel. I'm so glad she decided to come back after her five minutes of retirement. <laughs> So she was a parent educator for many years in the district up until June. Uh, Jill Cover, who is, teaches third grade at the elementary school. I love Jill's calm presence in her classroom. I'm thankful that she has invited me in each day during her core math time. I love watching her adjust her teaching on the spot if she notices students don't understand something. There is so much I could say about the amazing learning environment that she has created in her classroom, but you should probably check it out for yourselves as I cannot adequately give it the accolades it deserves. Paul and Ted, who are uh, our two facilities uh, staff, uh, they are always so willing to help with anything cheerful and happy and positive. Megan Henry teaches fourth grade at the elementary school. She stepped up in the most positive way. Actually, I put a, this is a combined one. Megan Henry, Madeline Parisi, and Le Leanna Dumas stepped up in the most positive way to support me here in every possible way, emotionally and physically. I'm incredibly grateful for the fourth grade team. Amy Heistrom has two separate ones. Amy works tirelessly to ensure students are getting the support that they need. She is a speech language pathologist at the primary elementary school. Amy Heistrom is an incredible asset to the elementary school. She has helped so many students over the years improve their communication. She's also an amazing resource for staff. Thank you, Amy, for your many years of service and dedication to our students. Jenny Liberty, who is the Director of Curriculum Assessment and Instruction for the SAU. Jenny has been an amazing support during my internship with Keene State. She has taken the time out of her schedule to meet with me and the other interns to help with assignments and to provide opportunities for learning. Her support is greatly appreciated. 
Brian McGinn, who is the interim assistant principal at the high school. Brian provided a valuable, valuable mentorship opportunity to me that I gratefully appreciate. I learned so much about the programs that are used at Hillsborough Deering High School and their supervision philosophy. I appreciate him for taking the time out of his busy schedule to meet with me. Mark Peterson, principal at the middle school. Mark has allowed me to join him to help chaperone during Hillsborough Deering Middle School events. All of the experiences were great. It was so fun seeing former students at the events. The support that was shown by the community for the dance was heartwarming. The students were so well behaved and had great manners too. Thank you for allowing me to chaperone with you. To all of the staff who supported the theme Year of the Book event, Danielle and I would like to thank Sue Kingsbury, Robin Whitney, Dagmar Harris, Paul McCook, and Pam Pascal, Gail Eaton, Anna Muncy, Chef Steph, Veronica Heitner, Kid Adventure staff, and all the staff who supported the Year of the Book theme night. We love co-hosting this great event and greatly appreciated all of your help and support. Mitch Silverman, who is the tech ed teacher at the middle school, thank you for all your support and going above and beyond in working with the sixth grade students. You have helped them to gain confidence in their woodworking abilities. And in that, you help them gain confidence in themselves. Thank you all for your support throughout the years. The whole sixth grade team, I cannot say enough great things about the sixth grade team. You all work cohesively together, create a welcoming atmosphere of the students, and treat each child with kindness and compassion. You are all absolutely awesome, and I am very proud to work with all of you. Amanda McFadden and Rebecca Persicino, who are paraeducators at the middle school. I could not ask for a better team to be working in my classroom. You two are absolutely amazing. You go above and beyond in supporting the students within the classroom, and they are very lucky to have you. Thank you for all that you do each and every day. There we go. All right. That's it. We Thank thought I had a whole nother page. <laughs> all right. And I'm sure there's more that just aren't in writing, but yeah, Sorry. thank you for sharing those and for everything that everyone does throughout the district very very well well deserved and that's uh, all that i have so that um, I, we can go forward with public comment and then we can see if we need to take a uh, a welfare check um mm -hmm. after that um public comment limited to five minutes per person this is the opportunity for members of the public to share an idea or concern with the board comments are limited to five minutes per person it's not the practice of the board to immediately respond to comments made um, but we will take that under advisement and you know bring that back when it, when appropriate. Um, so it looks like there's already one person coming. Okay, yeah, I will take care of that. Thank you. Um, and just get you name and name, you know the drill name and where you are for the record so that that's on recording. Hi again, Rache Colcom from Hillsborough. Um, my public comment again is follow up on the fund twenty five. Uh, I, you know, from the previous meeting, I had a few questions. I'm looking forward to hearing some answers tonight. However, some of the answers that I have received, um, I guess I still am looking for more information. So hopefully more information is coming. But where I want to start, I did a lot of research, as you guys know, on Fund 25. And in listening to the presentation that was made before me about um, keeping things open and transparent and and keeping the, the public informed it clearly hasn't happened with this fund since this fund has been a secret fund that even the school board wasn't aware of had transactions and and um, i'm stating that because there have been so far four previous school board members who said they knew nothing about this in looking at this fund there's a haslet trust that comes into this fund this is a seventy-five thousand dollar trust fund that was left to the town back in the early 1950s i believe 53 was the year it came in and in reading his trust fund and uh, looking at this i was able to determine that for over 40 years that earning those earnings that came in from the haslet trust was going directly to our revenue, directly to our operating budget, and it was consistent with what was written in the, in the trust fund that uh, Mr. Haslett left. And when looking at the IRS Form 990-PFs, going back to 2010, it also stated on those 990 that the purpose of this fund was for the school district for daily operations. In 1998, the school board decided that they were going to restrict the funds and um, the Haslett funds 
and they used them for something outside of the budget, I guess, or they, they restricted them in some fashion back in 98. And I realize none of you were here back then. Um, but I could tell from looking at all the old reports that going back to 98 and up through 2002, as well as everything prior to that, the Haslett Fund was reported on in our annual reports. After 2002, it was no longer reported in our annual reports. Um, I could see from the treasurer's report that the deposits came in and the deposits were made, but there was no other way that we could track how this money was being utilized. Uh, up until I started looking at the details of the trust fund, that I mean, the fund 25 that was sent to me for the last three years, I can see that this money was in there. I could also see from the last three years that all of the money had not been expended and has been running a balance. Currently, what I could tell is that there's about $31,000 of unexpended funds from this earnings. And I question why that is not being included in our operating agreement. When you read the details of his trust fund, and if you guys don't have it, I'm happy to share this with you. I did get this from the Attorney General's Office, the Charitable Trust Division. It does specify that the money could be used for teachers, for programs and at the very last sentence it does uh, it says that for paying teachers higher salaries than is paid now so therefore it could be put to the raises that the teachers are getting the balance of said net income if any may be used for general school purposes and again looking at the 990 it says for daily operations so i question why the taxpayers are not seeing this as a revenue source in our um, general fund i also want to go back I looked at our um, audit and I was trying to find this fund through our audit because I was told it was in the audit. And the answer to that is yes, it's in the audit, but there's a lot of inconsistencies in the audit. For example, on page 15 of the audit, it talks about the two major funds. Although last year it said that there were three, I'm sorry, two non-major funds. Last year it said there were three non-major funds. Um, in the audit on page 22, it lists this particular non-major fund as a payable that's receivable for food service. So it's labeled as food service and a total of 171,929. That's the same exact balance that's left in this interfund balance account on the asset sheet. So I'm interested as to why it's being labeled as food service. But on page 23 of the audit, it also lists that same amount as restricted under instructions. So I'm questioning, which is, is it food service or is it instruction money? Is it restricted in instruction money? Because I don't know how we can have that same amount as a payable for food service. And yet, by the way, there's not a single bit of food service that's being run through this account. So I don't understand why the audit report has this being labeled in several different ways. Um, there's also encumbrances. So there's a reserve for encumbrances in this fund 25. Encumbrances would be the general fund. It typically wouldn't be this other fund that you guys are running money through. And the encumbrances are in the, to the total of $253,744. This fund isn't even, doesn't even have that much revenue in it. This fund has less than $100,000 of revenue. The revenue is being Duncan Jenkins and the Haslett Trust. So how could we possibly be accruing this much in encumbrances? And again, when I look at the audit on page 38, it's labeled under the fund balance on page 38, it says fund balances beginning under the donation column. It actually has, um, oh shoot, I have the audit here. If you give me one second, I can find it. Page 38. Under the donations column for fund balances beginning, it shows $243,744, which is identical to the number that we have under our encumbrances for this year. So um, I don't know how that could be the beginning balance because that would usually be what 2022 ended with. And then the fund balance ending is the 171,929. There's just some discrepancies in following the audit report of this money. Um, and it just isn't telling us the story of what's actually happening with this account. So I think we need some clarification on that. And again, the Haslett Trust, I, I encourage you please to look at the Haslett Trust. But the other thing I would like to point out is last year in the 2022 report of this Fund 25, it showed an opening balance of 418826 and an ending balance of 250000 But yet when I look at the 2023 asset, the opening balance is zero. 
usually your ending balance from the previous year is equal to your beginning balance of the next year, and these balances don't reconcile. So we ended last year in this asset account with $250,000, but we started the 2023 year with zero and ended with $171,000. And the same similar with the encumbrances. When I go to the encumbrance, the encumbrance line for the fiscal year 2023 starts off with a beginning balance of zero. It ends with a beginning with an ending balance of 243,744. But yet when I look at the 2022 report, it says that the ending balance of this is the 418,826. There's a lot of discrepancies that are just raising questions here as to what is happening and what is being conducted in this fund. Um, so I have, I would love to get answers at the detailed level rather than what I saw in the packet and what I received by way of email was just a definition of what this fund is. I think there needs to be some serious inquiries into how the audit report reports this money, as well as um, the the detail of the trial balances. And if you guys haven't seen it, I'm happy to share what I have, but I'm suspecting that the school can share exactly what they shared with me. Can I, can I just ask? Please do. Uh, when you're talking about the audit report, you're not talking about internal audit, you're talking. I'm talking about the audit report that was done by um, the, the the people in Keene, um, Roberts, was it Robertson Green? Is that the right name, Robertson Green? Robertson Green, okay. I, I, if that's not the right name, I apologize. But I it's think probably, that it's, uh -huh. it's the audit report. It's, 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 it's the, the official, official audit report. report. The audit. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that. Thank you for bringing in your concerns and your questions to us. And then to follow up again on the presentation that was made for the board, the committees that the school board has, um, the various committees, the wellness committee, the policy committee, and all of that, um, those haven't been open to the public. They have not been published so that the public can attend. And I heard when you guys were organizing it and I was at that meeting, I often heard that we only have two school board members on there so that there isn't a quorum. Well, those committees still have to have a quorum. They still have to be open to the public for us to see. And I've gone looking and they've never been published and open. So that is, if you mind if I sure, respond to that. So as far as the, um, the questions with the fund, uh, we, we do have some information that uh, Grant is gonna share for us a little bit later in the meeting. As far as the, it, posting the agendas and the, the posting of the meetings. That's something that we had gotten some advice from the New Hampshire School Board Association from Lynn. I'm gonna go phone a friend here. It was late last week, yeah. late last week, um, because we had asked the question about that. And so that is a practice that we need to adjust and make sure um, that those are getting noticed properly and that will be happening starting with the meetings this week. So, um, and we'll make sure that that takes place. Thank you. Is, is there anyone, anyone else from the public that wishes to speak? So I guess uh, going going once, twice, three times. We will. Uh, it's eight seventeen. We'll leave public comment open as a rolling, um, and we're at that point where we'll leave it open for the, the rest of the meeting. We're at the consent agenda. How how's everybody feeling? Do we want to kind of persevere through? Let's do it. I'm saying a yes. Stacy, yes. Oh. Yeah, so we're, we're good. So, okay. <laughs> Just wanted to do a pulse check on our vote, make sure we're all doing okay. Um, consent agenda. So, we've got the approving of the minutes from the April 1st meeting and the appointments, leaves, and resignations, which are in our packet that we've had a chance to review. Um, is there anyone that wishes to pull anything out, or is there a motion to approve? I make a motion to approve the minutes as they stated the April 1st. And the, the consent agenda? Okay. Um, is there a second? Okay, so Mike makes that motion to approve the consent agenda. Um, Krista is seconding. Um, nothing's being pulled out. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. No opposed, no abstentions. Five, zero, zero. So it passes. Um, our student representative had emailed um, the superintendent myself. He's not able to be here this evening, so we can move over that and he'll have more for us at the May, yeah, the May meeting. Um, and so um, the superintendent's report. 
All right, so uh, a couple of things. Uh, the elementary school is hosting the theme with the bike safety topic, um, which would have been one of the things Mason was going to tell you about. 